Hey guys, this is Caleb from the Command Valley coming at you with another deck tech featuring another Double Masters Commander reprint. Here on the Command Valley we talk about all things Commander, provide you with weekly deck techs to help you brew, gameplay videos, and so much more. Be sure to check out our gameplay series, Duel of the Peaks. Episode 8 is coming out this Friday, and will feature the four decks we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. Before we get into the video, I'd like to give a huge shout out to our channel sponsor, Game Grid Lehigh. If you are in the Utah County area, definitely check out their store. Also, please be sure to like this video, subscribe if you haven't yet, and hit that bell to be notified about our weekly deck techs and other videos. We truly appreciate your support. Last but especially not least, we are excited to announce that we will be officially launching our Patreon with the upcoming episode of Duel of the Peaks, and it's going to be jam-packed with a ton of sweet stuff and extra content, so be sure to stay tuned. With all of that out of the way, let's dive into today's commander, Riss the Redeemed. Riss is a Selesnya or green-white commander that costs just one hybrid green-white to play. He is a 1-1 elf warrior with two abilities. The first costs two generic and one hybrid green-white and tap Riss to put a 1-1 green and white elf warrior creature token into play. His second ability costs 4 generic and 2 hybrid green white and tap wrists and it says for each creature token you control put a token into play that's a copy of that creature. The name of this deck is Riss Double Token Master because as his ability suggests, the goal is to create creature tokens and then create more creature tokens. There are a lot of ways to build Riss. You could do Elf Tribal, Populate, Tokens, etc. And I have decided to go with just a general token strategy with a lot of ways to buff up our tokens and make them bigger, meaner, and scarier than ever. So let's start off by talking about the other token makers in the deck. The first in our creature section is Avenger of Zendikar. When this monster of a card enters the battlefield, it creates a 0-1 plant creature token onto the battlefield for each land that you control. It also has a landfall trigger that lets you put a plus one plus one counter on each plant you control whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control. This goes really well with cards like Fabled Passage, Evolving Wilds, Terramorphic Expanse, and of course, Fetch Lands. Avenger of Zendikar and the army it brings with it can get completely out of hand really fast if our opponents don't deal with them. Brimaz, King of Oreskos, is an absolute beast and desperately needs a reprint. One generic and two white mana is a small price to pay for this 3-4 cat soldier. He has Vigilance and whenever Brimaz attacks, put a 1-1 white cat soldier creature token with Vigilance onto the battlefield attacking. The second ability is whenever Brimaz blocks a creature, put a 1-1 cat soldier creature token onto the battlefield blocking that creature. Getting free tokens for attacking and blocking that jump right in to help attack or block is super powerful, especially with Vigilance, thus the $20 price tag. If you can get your hands on Brimaz, you will definitely not be sorry. Hero of Bladehold also creates free tokens when it attacks, and attacking triggers its Battlecry ability. Battlecry gives all other attacking creatures plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, including the two 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens that she puts onto the field tapped and attacking with her. Imperious Perfect is probably better in an elf tribal strategy, but she is really good in our general token strategy as well. She gives all other elf creatures that we control plus one plus one. She also says pay one green and tap Imperious Perfect to put a one one green elf warrior creature token into play. So she essentially gives us a two two elf and buffs any other elves that we already have on the field including Riss, our commander and the tokens that he makes and the majority of our mana dorks. Be careful not to misread Tendershoot Dryad like I did the first time I saw it. It costs 4 generic and a green and is a 2-2 Dryad. So far not so great, however it also has Ascend which gives you the city's blessing permanently if you control 10 or more permanents while also controlling Tendershoot Dryad. The part that I misread says, at the beginning of each upkeep create a 1-1 green sapperling creature token. That's right, not just your upkeep, each upkeep. Commander games typically have at least three other players, which means that by the time it's your upkeep again, Tendershoot Dryad will have created four tokens. And if you have the City's Blessing, its last ability gives all sapperlings that you control plus two plus two. 
Tender Shoot Dryad is the gift that just keeps on giving. Voice of Resurgence is not the most powerful card in the deck, but it can be a good deterrent, it replaces itself when it dies, and it only costs a green and a white to cast. Its ability creates a green and white elemental creature token with power and toughness equal to the number of creatures that you control whenever an opponent casts a spell during our turn or when Voice of Resurgence dies. Those tokens can get pretty big, especially in the late game. Other creatures to consider including are Elder Gargaroth, Arasta of the Endless Web, Mycoloth, Rampaging Baloths, Harmonious Archon, and Armada Worm. The enchantments in this section of the deck are really expensive and not necessary for you to have fun. However, they are ridiculously powerful, so if you can get them or your group is okay with proxies, then definitely do it. Anointed Procession, Doubling Season, and Parallel Lives each say, if an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, it creates twice that many of those tokens instead. These enchantments can get insanely out of hand when combined with any of our many token makers, Riss's last ability, and especially together. If you have two of these enchantments out and an effect creates just one token, you will get it doubled to two and then doubled again to four instead. Another example, if you were to create three tokens with two of these enchantments out, you would double it to six and then double it again to 12. Again, these enchantments are not required for the deck. You don't need them to have fun. If you can get them or proxy them and your group is fine with that, definitely play them. Simply put, Divine Visitation turns any creature token that would enter the battlefield under your control into a 4-4 White Angel creature token with Flying and Vigilance instead. So, the 701 plants that you would have gotten from Avenger of Zendikar all become Sarah Angels instead. Yup, pretty sweet. Other cards that you could play in this section are Luminarch Ascension, which is a great card in the early game, but not so great in the late game. You've also got Sandworm Convergence. Legion's Landing slash Adanto the First Fort, and Dawn of Hope if you are including cards like the Soul Sisters and other life gain cards, which is also a good strategy for Riss. Moving on to the instance in this section of the deck, we have Arachnogenesis, which is another, unfortunately, $20 card that desperately needs a reprint because it is super good. For two and a green, you put a 1-2 green spider token with reach onto the battlefield for each creature that's attacking you. Then, you prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn by non-spider creatures. This card is a one-sided fog, a token maker, and potentially removal all at once. Call the Copper Coats is a super cool new card from Commander 2020. It costs two and a white, then it has Strive, which says this spell costs one and a white more to cast for each target beyond the first. And the main ability says, choose any number of target opponents, create X11 white human soldier creature tokens, where X is the number of creatures those opponents control. Absolutely love the flexibility on this card, and it's a little bit meta dependent, but if you play against a lot of creature decks in your meta, you will be really happy to have this cheap and awesome card in your deck. Curious Herd is another new card from Commander 2020 that says, Choose target opponent. Create X33 green beast creature tokens, where X is the number of artifacts that player controls. It's not even close to as good as Dockside Extortionist because it's not ramp and it only chooses one opponent instead of all of them, but we have seen this type of effect really work in our meta and you're almost always likely going to be able to get at least two or three tokens out of this card. March of the Multitude costs X, one green, and two white. It also has Convoke, which lets your creatures tap to add one generic to the X cost to help cast it. Then it says create X, one, one white soldier creature tokens with lifelink. The best part about this is that Convoke gets around summoning sickness. So for example, say I just created five tokens with Call the Copper Coats or Curious Herd. Even if I only have three lands untapped after casting that, I can cast March of the Multitude for X equal to five by tapping those tokens and my remaining three lands. So pretty sweet. Secure the Waste costs X and white to instantly put X 1-1 white warrior creature tokens onto the battlefield. This card is super flexible and it gets you tokens at an awesome rate. A couple other instants that you could consider putting into this section of the deck include Second Harvest and White Sun's Zenith. 
For sorceries, we've got Increasing Devotion, which gives us 5 one, one white humans for 5 mana. It also has flashback for 9 mana, and when you flash it back, you get 10 one, one white humans instead. Martial Coup doubles as a pseudo one-sided board wipe and a token maker. For X and 2 white, you put X 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens onto the battlefield, and if X is 5 or more, you destroy all other creatures. We will touch on it a little bit later, but this deck has quite a few ways of making all of our creatures temporarily indestructible. Combining this card with an effect like that can be absolutely devastating and overwhelming for our opponents. Other sorceries to consider in this section of the deck include Finale of Glory, Nomad's Assembly, Sylvan Offering, which can be a really fun political card, and Devout Invocation, which I really wish was an instant for that crazy cost, but it is still a really, really good card if you can go a full turn cycle without a board wipe. As for Planeswalkers, I am personally only running Elspeth Sun's Champion. She costs 4 generic and 2 white mana and enters with 4 loyalty counters. Her plus 1 makes us 3 one, 1 white soldier tokens, which is awesome. Her minus 3 destroys all creatures with power 4 or greater, and if you can manage to activate her ultimate by some miracle, you get an emblem that says creatures you control get plus 2, plus 2, and have flying. With a board full of tokens, that could very, very easily be the end of the game. Other planeswalkers to consider running are Freilies, Nissa Voice of Zendikar, and Garrick Primal Hunter. Really quickly, let's go over the ramp in this deck. There is, of course, Soul Ring, and we also have our mana dorks, such as Avacyn's Pilgrim, Elvish Archdruid, Elvish Mystic, Findhorn Elves, Llanowar Elves, Marwyn, Paradise Druid, and Priest of Titania. I especially like Marwyn, since we can easily pump her up with Riss, and the same sort of goes for Priest of Titania, who taps to add one green for each elf on the battlefield. Nature's Lore is the only non-permanent ramp that I have included in the deck. You are, of course, free to include cards such as Cultivate, Kodama's Reach, and Sky Shroud Claim. I just love grabbing those dual lands that are also forests for super cheap. I'm also running a couple of really powerful ramp enchantments. Cryptolith Rite, for example, turns all of our creatures into mana dorks that tap for any color, and Mirari's Wake is a card I finally picked up that gives all creatures plus one plus one and doubles the mana generated from tapping your lands. Last but definitely not least, I'm running Growing Rites of Itlamok and Gaia's Cradle. Growing Rites of Itlamok transforms into Itlamok Cradle of the Sun if you have four or more creatures on your end step, which you can very easily do in this deck. And it is rightly named as it is a slightly better Gaia's Cradle on the back. Both of these lands have the ability to add a green to your mana pool for each creature you control. You do not have to own these cards to build this deck. If you already have them, or you can buy them, or your group will allow you to run proxies of them, then these will be the most powerful ramp cards in the deck, because you are going to have a lot of creatures. If not, don't worry about it, you can still build the deck, and you can still have tons of fun without these cards. Alright, let's move on to card advantage. Beast Whisperer and Guardian Project both essentially draw you a card whenever you play a creature. Beast Whisperer is off of the cast and Guardian Project on the ETB. Eternal Witness returns a card from your graveyard to your hand when it enters the battlefield. Mentor of the Meek allows you to pay one generic mana any time another creature, including tokens, with power two or less enter the battlefield under your control. One of my favorite cards in the deck is the incredibly scary Orin Frostfang. For three generic and two green, you get a 2-6 that says attacking creatures you control have death touch. Which is frightening. And whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. This card is a win-win for you and 99% of the time a lose-lose for your opponent and it is difficult to kill in combat because of that huge butt. When you swing in with your army of 1-1 tokens, you're either drawing a card or killing an opponent's creature for each one. I absolutely love Orin Frostfang. Collective Unconscious draws you a card for each creature you control. Return of the Wild Speaker is a modal instant that can either draw you cards equal to the greatest power among non-humans you control, or it can give all of your non-human creatures plus three plus three until end of turn, which can finish games quite easily with the amount of tokens we're creating. 
and I've saved the best for last, and that is Skull Clamp. Any deck with lots of 1-1 creatures or tokens should definitely consider running Skull Clamp, as it is likely to be the best card draw in the deck. It costs 1 to play and 1 to equip to a creature. The equipped creature gets plus 1, minus 1, and whenever the equipped creature dies, you draw 2 cards. Paying 1 mana and sacrificing a tiny token when we've got 15 of them is a very small price to pay to draw 2 cards. Really quick, our suite of removal includes the following. Path to Exile and Swords to Plowshares as super reliable 1 mana creature removal spells. Aura Shards lets us destroy an artifact or enchantment whenever a creature ETBs under our control. Sundering Growth destroys an artifact or enchantment at instant speed for just 2 mana and then lets us populate or make a copy of one of our tokens. Lastly, Beast Within destroys any type of permanent and exchanges it for a 3-3 beast token. As for board wipes, we're also running Austere Command, which is one of the best white board wipes out there as it is ready for almost any and every situation. Hour of Reckoning is another card with Convoke and it destroys all non-token creatures. And we've already talked about Martial Coup. The best kind of board wipes in EDH are the one-sided board wipes, and all of these have potential to be at least partially one-sided. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a good amount of cards that can make our creatures indestructible to guard against board wipes, including our own. Heroic Intervention has received a much needed reprint in the latest core set, so definitely pick one up while they're hot off the press and under 10 bucks. It will give all your permanents hexproof and indestructible until end of turn for just 2 mana at instant speed. Flawless Maneuver is an instant for 2 and a white, and it can be cast for free if you control a commander. It gives creatures that you control indestructible until end of turn. Playing this for free and then blowing up the board makes all of our board wipes essentially white's version of Cyclonic Rift. Selfless Spirit and Dauntless Escort are both creatures that you can sacrifice to give all the rest of your creatures indestructible until end of turn. Shalai, Voice of Plenty, costs 3 and a white to cast, and she's a 3-4 with flying and says, You, Planeswalkers you control, and other creatures you control have hexproof. And if that weren't enough, she also has an activated ability for 4 and 2 green to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature you control, which is perfect for our go-wide strategy. Now let's talk about some combat enablers. A bunch of tiny 1-1 tokens is good, but here is how we're going to make them great. Wiltleaf Liege costs 1 generic and 3 hybrid green-white mana to cast. It's a 4-4 that gives all other green creatures you control plus 1 plus 1 and all other white creatures you control plus 1 plus 1. So, you know those 1-1 one, one tokens that you can produce with risk? Well, they are now all 3-3s. Three yep, every single creature in the deck benefits from Wiltleaf Liege and some of them benefit twice, which is absolutely fantastic. Elish Norn Grand Cenobite is not only one of the absolute best cards in the deck, it's one of the meanest too. You're almost sure to become the target when you play Elish Norn, but she is so worth it if you can protect her. For 5 and 2 white, she's a 4-7 with Vigilance, and she gives all of your creatures plus 2 plus 2, and all of your opponent's creatures minus 2 minus 2. Giving your creatures a 4 point swing on power and toughness over your opponent's creatures, that is, if they survive the minus 2 minus 2, is an absolutely devastating blow. Next up we've got Champion of Lamholt that comes in as a 1-1 one, one for 1 and 2 green. However, whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Champion of Lamholt, which is super important because her other ability says creatures with power less than Champion of Lamholt's power can't block creatures you control. So if you play Champion of Lamholt, and then call the copper coats and get 5 tokens, then champion is going to get 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters, and the rest of your creatures without summoning sickness can immediately attack that turn and only creatures with power 6 or greater can block them. Miri Weatherlight Duelist costs 3 to cast for a 3-2 legendary cat warrior with first strike. She also has 2 more abilities that make you nearly a master of combat. The first says whenever Miri attacks, each opponent can't block with more than one creature that combat. Even if they have an infinite amount of creature tokens, they can still only block with one. 
Additionally, as long as Miri is tapped, only one creature can attack you each combat. The only downside to Miri is that you have to find a place to attack where she's not going to die. Otherwise, your opponents are definitely going to try to block and kill her. Eldrazi Monument is an artifact that costs 5 to cast and gives all your creatures plus 1 plus 1, flying and indestructible. However, it also forces you to sacrifice a creature at the beginning of your upkeep, and if you can't, then you have to sacrifice Eldrazi Monument. You're going to have plenty of fodder as long as you don't play this into an empty board, and it protects your fodder from the majority of board wipes, which is absolutely fantastic. Beastmaster Ascension is an enchantment that costs 2 and a green to cast. Whenever a creature that you control attacks, you may put a quest counter on it. As long as Beastmaster Ascension has 7 or more quest counters on it, creatures you control get plus 5 plus 5. Making your army of 1-1 one, one tokens into an army of 6-6s six will absolutely demolish your opponents. Many of these enablers can be considered win conditions as the main strategy of the deck is to go wide and overwhelm. However, some of the more surefire ways of winning are, of course, overrun type effects. The best being Crater Hoof Behemoth. Crater Hoof Behemoth is a 5-5 that has haste and when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain trample and get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control, which is going to be a lot of creatures. Some much more affordable options include Overrun itself, Overwhelming Stampede, and End Raise Forerunners. Triumph of the Hordes is also a bit pricey, but a super reliable way to end players. Let's go quickly through the land base for this deck. I have, of course, included Command Tower. I'm also running Bountiful Promenade, Canopy Vista, Horizon Canopy, Savannah, Sun Petal Grove, Temple Garden, and Wooded Bastion as my dual lands. Castle Garenbrig, Gaia's Cradle, Mosswarp Bridge, and Windswept Heath as utility lands that do not tap for colorless. And that's important to note because I am running Mirror Pool, which requires additional colorless mana to activate its abilities. So I have also included Gavney Township, Hall of Hilliod's Generosity, Crosan Verge, Reliquary Tower, Rogue's Passage, and Wirewood Lodge, which are all great utility lands that can tap for colorless mana. Lastly, I am running 9 forests and 8 plains. Alright, you've made it to the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you have fun buying singles or cracking packs from the new Double Masters set. If you are watching this on YouTube, please feel free to comment below and tell us what commanders you are building decks for from Double Masters. Also, let us know if you have any questions, noticed something that we missed, and what other commanders you'd be interested in seeing us do for videos. Please like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell to be notified about our weekly deck techs, set reviews, and gameplay videos. Subscribing to our channel is the easiest way to help support us, and it's completely free. Be sure to tune into this week's Duel of the Peaks episode and check out our Patreon when it officially launches this Friday alongside episode 8 of Duel of the Peaks. We really appreciate all of your support. Thanks everybody. Stay safe out there.